Canto 3, chapter 12, text 40. Deities of fire sacrifices. Shodashi, Ukta, Purishi, Agishtoma, Akturyama, Atiratra, Vajapaya, and Gosava became manifested from the eastern mouth of Brahma. <clears throat> text 41. Vijadanam tapaksacham dharmas yeti padani cha ashramam cha yathasankyam ashrajat saha vrittivi. Education, charity, penance, and truth are said to be the four legs of religion. And to learn this, there are four orders of life with different classifications of castes according to vocation. Brahma created all these in systematic order. Purport. The nucleus of the four social orders, Brahmacharya or student life, Vihasta or household family life, Banaprasta or retired life for practicing penance, and Sannyas or renounced life for preaching the truth, is the four legs of religion. The vocational divisions are the Brahmanas or the intelligent class, the Kshatriyas or administrative class, the Vaishyas or mercantile productive class, and the Sudras or general labor class who have no special specific, have no specific qualification. Or were, all were systematically planned and created by Brahma for the regular promotion of self-realization. Student life is meant for acquiring the best education. Household family life is meant for gratifying the senses provided it is performed with a charitable disposition of mind. Retirement from household life is meant for penance, for advancement in spiritual life, and renounced life is meant for preaching the absolute truth to the people in general. The combined actions of all members of society make the whole situation favorable for the upliftment of the mission of human life. The beginning of this social institution is based on education, meant for purifying the animal propensities of the human being. The highest purificatory process is knowledge of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the purest of the pure. The Jadanam Tavaksatyam Dharmas Yeti Padani Cha Ashramam Cha Yata Sankyam Ashvijat Sahavrittivi. Education, charity, penance, and truth are said to be the four legs of religion. And to learn this, there are four orders of life with different classifications of castes according to vocation. Brahma created all these in systematic order. So Lord Brahma, knowing well the requirement of the living entities to be organized, uh, created the orders of life. <coughs> As these orders of life in Varnashram are the regulative principle in a human society. In order to accomplish the principles of religion, namely education, charity, penance, and truth, these orders are essential. You have to uh, have some systematic methodology for organizing the society in order to give the society the opportunity to attain these religious qualities. There needs to be some kind of systematic organization in order to just give people what is real education, real charity, penance, and, tru and truthfulness. Nowadays, the modern society teaches all the wrong qualities. It teaches one how to be a liar, just like all of the advertising. It's simply lie. Everybody, even they know their product's no good. They tell everybody it's very good. Even they know their product will kill you, still they advertise it is very good for you. So we learn this art of, true, of lying from a very early age. Everybody knows that every lawyer in the courtroom who's defending somebody who's guilty and knows it is simply lying when he tells the court that his client is innocent. It's somehow that kind of lying is accepted as socially good. <coughs> but factually speaking, it's all lie. We are even accustomed to lying for simple things. 
we lie to each other when somebody asks, how are we? We say, oh, we're fine. <laughs> of course, that kind of lying is socially acceptable. But still, you can go right down the line. So many various forms of socially acceptable lying. But that breeds socially unacceptable lying. And if the society is a fallen one, then whether it's socially accepted or not has nothing to do with the religious principle. Because the religious principle is that truthfulness must be there. Actually, for a brahmana, if his enemy walks up to him and asks him, give me your money, how much is there? He will say, I have everything. This is all my money here, take it. Truthful. Then Prabhupada clarified that in a later comment by saying, but he must not be stupid. <laughs> There's also another phrase, satyam bruyat priyam bruyat. Truth that is palatable should be spoken. Otherwise, unpalatable truth should not be spoken. Yeah. Let's say somebody has a nose like this. So one walks up and says, all right, sir, you have a nose like this. That may be the truth, but it is not what you say. It just makes agitation. Yeah. Not very good quality to go and criticize people like that. So if the truth has some palatability to it, there's a possibility to accept it, then you can do it. But the principle also is sate satyam samatra. If you're dealing with a rascal, that's no time to become a brahmana. It's like a rascal. His main business is to cause you trouble. So he will simply utilize your good qualities to cause you trouble. So when he's ready to make you trouble, it's no time to become a brahmana to give him all facility to make you trouble. One has to somehow or another take care of himself in a situation. So sate satam samatra means basically you reciprocate in kind. If you're being attacked by some rascal, there's no time to become a brahmana and let him take away everything what you've got. But yet still, the mood of the brahmana is he's so honest he will even tell his enemy where his money is to take it all away. Now, for Shachiyas, this principle is very interesting because we see, although they should not have done it, still they acted according to this principle. All these things considered, in other words, you may be understanding by now there's no absolute here. It depends on time, place, and circumstance. But all things considered, when... Uh, Maharaj Yudhisthira went and asked Duryodhana for those arrows which Grandfather Bhishma had given to Duryodhana. For those who don't know, uh, in the Battle of Kurukshetra, Duryodhana accused Grandfather Bhishma of not fighting very powerfully against the Pandavas because he had some favorable inclination to them. So Grandfather Bhishma had these five arrows, special arrows, and he said, with these five arrows, I will kill all five Pandavas tomorrow. So Duryodhana was very happy about that, he said, but he said, but you better give them to me. I'll keep them safely until tomorrow, in case you change your mind or something like that. So he took those five arrows, but Krishna knew all this. So Krishna told, uh, you just go and get those arrows. So there was some favor that had to be repaid. So he went and asked Duryodhana, you give me something? And Duryodhana said, yes, I will give you anything, even the whole kingdom if you want. Of course, no Shatru would have asked for the kingdom in the middle of a battle like this in charity. So he said, well, I just want those five arrows. Ooh, that was worse. <laughs> yeah. And Duryodhana gave them over. Yeah. This is another kind of culture something which you don't find nowadays, anywhere. It's actually based on truth. He had them, he had those arrows, and he knew he had to give some kind of favor in return because he was owed a favor when the 
uh, gurus were attacked by Gandharvas and embarrassed because they were defeated, and all the Pandavas were in exile. They came out of exile just long enough to defeat the Gandharvas. And Duryodhana knew he had one favor to give back to Maharaj Yudhisthira. So we can understand there's a truthfulness there. Nowadays, if there is even a person who owes all kinds of favors, he doesn't care. He'll take something even more. He doesn't, he's not concerned with keeping a balance there. The rascal. And as far as these other qualities, charity, donum, people will only give charity if it can give them some political pressure on somebody or if it will give them some tax relief or if it will make them feel good in their hearts that they're a good person, even if it doesn't do any good to charity. People are motivated, motivated to giving charity at a particular time, place, or manner, as they like, which benefits them. But that's not the purpose of charity. Charity is meant for a purification and to help others. Therefore, in the Vedic culture, charity is given simply as a question of purification to those who are worthy in the right time, place, and circumstances. When the great saintly person is, came by, immediately the Householders were trying to figure out how much charity they could give, as much as possible. That's the householder principle, to give in charity. Prabhupada often described how the householder, before taking uh, prasadam, would go out into the street and cry in a big voice, not a little voice, if there's anybody who's hungry, let him please come and take his meal. And then after everybody has taken, then only he would eat. Nowadays, you will not find that principle being followed by anybody. There's nobody who will follow that principle. Although 50, 60, 70 years ago, 80 maybe, this principle was followed. Prabhupada said even in his house, there was minimum five guests for every meal. Minimum five guests for every meal. Because his father wanted always to feed sadhus. And he didn't even mind so much whether they were bogus sadhus or real sadhus. He, he thought it was not his duty to make the distinction between who was bogus and who was real when simply giving prasadam. He was just simply giving out of the principle of charity. And that family was always quite uh, happy. Actually, that family was all pure devotees. <laughs> so we find that these principles are very purifying. When you always give to others, you're not, you're not so attached yourself uh, to all of these things when you're always giving to others. That gives very good um, indication of charity. Uh, ah, excuse me. It gives a very good realization of the charity principle because one is feeling very much detached. He doesn't feel, this is mine. And therefore, I must keep it and squeeze whatever sense gratification I can out of it. No, he thinks, this is Krishna's. This is actual religious principle. That when one realizes everything belongs to Krishna, everything is Krishna's already. It's not that if I give it to Krishna, then it belongs to Krishna. In the meantime, it belongs to me. No, everything's already Krishna's. Everything's his already. He's the supreme enjoyer. He's the supreme controller. He is the Lord of all existence. He created it. He gave it. It's his. That's the fact. Now I'm using it for some time. But on demand, it has to be returned. Sometimes Krishna demands, give me everything. Sometimes Krishna arranges so that one of his representatives may demand, or may not even demand, but may expect, or may not even expect, but may be available to be given to. And then one has to understand these things belong to Krishna, and if Krishna wants them to be used in his service, 
then I must be willing to cooperate with that because nothing is mine. Your mama. Nowadays, the idea is everything is mine. Nothing is Krishna's. In order to establish that principle, they will simply uh, create the mental speculation that uh, there is no Krishna. Because obviously the next logical conclusion is if there is a Krishna who created and everything comes from him, then obviously everything belongs to him. So because there, I don't want anything to belong to anybody but me, so the first logical thing I should do is to deny the existence of Krishna. As if your simple denial of the existence of God is sufficient to remove his proprietorship. But they believe what they say. Their, their principle is to believe what they say. In fact, most people only believe what they say. They have a, as a regulative principle that whatever they say is the absolute truth. Whatever anyone else says is subject to investigation before acceptance. And anything that Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita is subject to immediate rejection. But what they say, this is the absolute truth. Now before you can take such a position, one has to be willing to demonstrate how he's the controller. Because if whatever you say is true, either you know everything, which means you're the supreme, or simply by you saying something, it creates truth. But then that must mean you're the creator. So then demonstrate it, at least in one way, by creating something small, even a little something. And we will see if you're the creator or not. And if you have all knowledge, then you kindly tell me what I have in my desk drawer. Oh, you cannot. Oh, too bad. Then what is your knowledge worth? What is your creation potency? And then how can you proclaim yourself God? Yet such a person who is so limited in potency will deny the existence of the Supreme. And what is his proof? Simply because everything came from chemicals. And what is that proof? Some mental speculation in the mind of somebody somewhere, which he simply accepts on blind faith as a religion. <coughs> the religion of the scientists is based on avidya, ignorance. Because they don't know, but they simply say, and that's the basis. Avidya, ignorance. Scientists do not give charity. They don't even know the meaning of the word. They are busy supplying everybody with bombs and chemicals and destroying the world. That they can give. Very nice. That's their charity to mankind. And as far as penance... They don't know the meaning of the word. And as far as austerity, if there's any austerity involved, they're not interested in the job. They'll only do the job so long as they can get sense gratification, enjoyment, otherwise they won't do. But what is the use? Such an occupational duty doesn't bring about any advancement or purification. It is simply acting in a religion which at the end brings about the destruction even of the person who created all these nice so-called facilities within it. This religion of scientifism is one of the greatest problems in the material world. One of the greatest problems in the material world has been created by this blind following of scientific knowledge and reasoning. And it's all based on simply blind faith. And we find that these good qualities or these qualities of religion are nowhere to be found within the society of scientific persons. They don't even know any of these things. And the only thing they can benefit people with is more destructive things. And maybe sometimes they make something which somebody can use, but it's only a byproduct of the destructive thing. 
Just like even a computer, right? We may use a computer. But why was the computer invented? And why is it continuously being invented and upgraded more and more? Well, obviously, just so they can guide their missiles and their rockets and their radars and their satellites for making more. Otherwise, it would never have been there. If it wasn't for the requirement of the government to kill others, or else kill them economically by taking all their money in the form of taxes and managing all that with a big computer, there wouldn't have been a need for these things. Nobody would have ever had them or used them. But it's all because of the, even TV was invented by the military for military purposes. Sometime in 1930s, they came out with the TV, the purpose being to somehow advance the military cause during wartime. So we find that everything starts off because it's useful for killing others. So the whole human civilization is based on the slaughter of living beings, ultimately. One man wrote a book, how all advancement has taken place simply because of war. So such a human society based on destruction like this can only have one end self-destruction and it's all because they reject the existence of the supreme and accept themselves as supreme without any other understanding they reject krishna and accept themselves as the supreme enjoyers the supreme controllers why because they live within a vid- ignorance and those who live within knowledge know that one must Always offer everything he has. Dhanam, all his charity. Tapas, all his austerity. Ganam, all of his knowledge. And above all, his body, mind, and words. The body. This, this thing which we are so attached to must be offered to Krishna. Then it will have some value. The mind, that thing which is always wandering around all three worlds, up and down and all over the place, according to the whimsy of the mental situation, must be offered in Krishna's service. All wealth, even family members, everything must be utilized in the service of the Lord, otherwise it has no value. Therefore, our whole Krishna consciousness movement is the complete antithesis total opposite of materialistic uh, scientifism. Sometimes people ask, why are you always so much on the case of the scientists? They think that's weird and strange and wrong. Because everybody's brainwashed by these basic assumptions which scientists are pushing into the human society. And when you actually become a bona fide follower of the Vedic principles of surrender to Krishna, and then you realize that where all this rascaldom is originating. So therefore, we have a great dedication to satisfy Krishna, to serve Krishna. So we will be giving everything to Krishna, even if the materialists sometimes say, why are you doing like this? Why don't you keep something for yourself? So in this way, We don't care what the materialists say. We go on anyway with our service in a very nice way, very happily engaged in Krishna's service and increasing our, uh, increasing our spiritual Krishna consciousness more and more by always thinking about Krishna and chanting Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. And this will actually make best use of this human form of life. Otherwise, anything else will simply be some kind of uh, surrender to this demoniac philosophical mentality of the mundane scientific point of view. Hare Krishna. Vasudevaya, 
Shimad Bhagavatam, Canto 3, Chapter 12, Text 42. Translation. Then the thread ceremony for the twice born was inaugurated, as were the rules to be followed for at least one year after acceptance of the Vedas, rules for observing complete abstinence from sex life, vocation in terms of Vedic injunctions, various professional duties in household life, and the main method of maintaining a livelihood without anyone's cooperation by picking up rejected grains. Purport. During student life, the brahmacharis were given full instructions about the importance of the human form of life. Thus, the basic education was designed to encourage the student in becoming free from family encumbrances. Only students unable to accept such a vow in life were allowed to go home and marry a suitable wife. Otherwise, the student would remain a permanent brahmachari, observing complete abstinence from sex life for his whole life. It all depended on the quality of the student's training. We had the opportunity to meet an avowed brahmachari in the personality of our spiritual master, Om Vishnupad Sri Srimad Bhaktisiddhanta Goswami Maharaj. <coughs> Such a great soul is called a Naishtika Brahmachari. Savitram Prajapucham Cha Brahmam Cha Tabrihatta Vata Sanchaya Shalina Shiloncha Iti Vaigrihe. Then the thread ceremony for the twice born was inaugurated, as were the rules to be followed for at least one year after acceptance of the Vedas. Rules for observing complete abstinence from sex life, vocations in terms of Vedic injunctions, various professional duties in household life, and the method of maintaining a livelihood without anyone's cooperation by picking up rejected grains. So in the function of the uh, teacher, or spiritual master, there is a period of testing whereby one has to actually fulfill the order or mission of the spiritual master for some time. And generally that time is considered to be at least one year. Even in the Shasta, as it is stated here, before one can accept initiation thereby granting that the student has some sincerity. Some sincerity. After all, you cannot do these Vedic injunctions and rules and regulations strictly for one year unless there is some sincerity. So the demand is there. Demand for some uh, sincere activity in devotional service following the rules and regulations prescribed by the spiritual master or prescribed by the Vedas, there's no difference. Then when the spiritual master can see there is some sincerity and the disciple is very much eager to accept the initiation, then the spiritual master may grant. But when the spiritual master sees that the disciple is actually following, is actually doing things in a correct fashion and has actually learned something about Krishna consciousness, he may then grant the diksha initiation. Of course, sometimes we grant even to an unqualified person to give them a chance to serve Krishna, and that is a risk. Uh, actually, one should test very carefully in order to prevent from having to take too many risks in Krishna consciousness because too many risks are not good. Although one may take some risk, too many risks are not good because it causes trouble and trouble makes more trouble in this way life goes on. So uh, the rules we have are headed by the rule of abstaining from sex life, celibacy. 
because of all the rules and regulations, this one is seemingly to be the most important because, uh, after all, just from the point of view of health, one could be a vegetarian and that would certainly be better. Uh, from the point of view of not wanting to waste one's money, he could give up gambling. <coughs> and it doesn't take much taste to give up intoxication. But this illicit sex business is almost impossible for the conditioned soul to give up. Nobody does it out of any normal mode of nature. It is something that must be done with the intelligence because one can understand that the entanglement that takes place within this material world is bound by that hard knot that is within the heart. Frid Rogam Khan, it is called in the Bhagavatam. The uh, very strong, intense attachment in the heart for all of this illicit sex business. So, this strong attachment in the heart is almost impossible to break unless one uses great intelligence in Krishna consciousness. Otherwise, there's no consideration of giving up such things. No one understands even why they should or why they would. <laughs> even understanding why they would is very difficult. Sometimes people, they just look at us and are amazed, say, why? What is wrong? They don't know what is wrong. But the wrong is, is that one becomes so intensely attached to the material nature that he stays here forever. And that is wrong. After all, to remain in the material world bound up, hand and foot, day and night, all the time, body after body, this is not very pleasant, is it? Of course, some people think it's very pleasant, so they may remain. What can we say? No matter what philosophy you give such persons, their idea is that it's very pleasant here in the material world. Everything's very nice. Therefore, it is much better to stay and suffer and enjoy. They say, yes, after all, there are some sufferings. That's all right. But basically, there's a lot of enjoyment. So we will tolerate all this uh, suffering for the sake of enjoying for the sake of enjoying, we don't mind so much suffering because uh, the enjoying is worth so much. I've often explained about the experiment they do with monkeys, giving them shocks in order to see how interested they are in getting some good food to taste. And they don't even care about the shocks. Uh, so similarly in the material world, we are very much interested in the enjoying that may come and we don't even care about the shocks of the material nature. And the material nature gives them, oh yes, material nature is continuously giving us shocks in this way and that way. And there's no peace. There's no peace. Although they make medical advancement and try to cure this or that disease, there's another one to replace it, don't worry. Although they try to make old age as painless as possible, it's still not very nice, don't worry. The same business is going on in suffering condition, whether it's now or it's 40 million years ago. You just have the same kind of suffering condition. Man previously was suffering from disease and old age. Uh, presently he's suffering from disease and old age. In the future he will also continue suffering from disease and old age. It is 
universal that death will take place. It is universal that everybody's mind gives them trouble. That's universal principle. If somebody were to write 100 million years ago, if it was especially in Kali Yuga, then he would be writing about the troubles of the mind, psychological troubles, because that is natural. So long as one has got uncontrolled senses, the mind must remain uncontrolled as well. Uncontrolled senses and uncontrolled mind are natural and they are uh, giving one trouble continuously all the time. Of course, natural doesn't mean good. Sometimes they say, if it is natural, it is good. Therefore, they make all kinds of claims that, uh, yes, we should simply enjoy sense gratification because it's natural. Tongue wants to eat, so it's natural to give it food to eat and tasty food at that. But that by that same logic, then some people would just eat chocolate bars all day. Potato chips. What other nonsense there is? That's natural, isn't it? If it tastes good, eat it. Isn't that natural? The animal does like that. If it smells good, he eats it. So, that's natural. But we don't do like that. We know if you just eat chocolate bars and potato chips all day, first thing that happens is all your teeth fall out, all your hair falls out. You get sick like anything. Everybody knows or should know. You shouldn't do things like that. You eat balanced diet, then some healthy condition can come. Yet, people will proclaim natural means unrestricted. They think if it's an unrestricted thing, then it's natural. They use the same argument for sex. They say it's natural to have sex, so therefore you should do it as much as you like, wherever you like, however you like. Without understanding, but the same rule applies. Without restriction, without uh, regulation, it will cause disease of another kind. Fidrogum common means heart disease. Uh, We're not talking about the normal kind of heart disease that they talk about in the medical journals. We're talking about the deepest heart disease. The disease which keeps everybody wrapped up in this material world. Just as a normal disease would keep one wrapped up in the hospital, this heart disease keeps you wrapped up in this jail of the material nature. So, what is natural cannot be defined in terms of the material energy. You cannot just say, this is natural, therefore it's good. One may also say, the monkey lives without any clothes. So the people should also live without any clothes. And they do say like this, in the summer. But I would say, I've often challenged such persons, then you must do it also in the winter. Because the monkey, he lives without any clothes in the summer. That's all right. But in the winter, he also lives without any clothes. He grows hair. That's natural. So you can also grow hair all over the place and live outside in the winter without any clothes. That's natural. But why do you accept only in the summertime and not in the wintertime? If you are thinking of being natural, be natural all the time. But no, they make such designations only in terms of sense gratification. So then, they say it's natural to enjoy. But I say, why? Who will designate what is natural and not? Because if you say it's natural to enjoy because you enjoy, well then I can say it's natural to suffer because you suffer. What will bring the definition of what is natural? 
Who will decide? Will we have votes? Democratic vote. This is natural, this is unnatural. We can see that just acting according to the body and its nature and the material nature, that doesn't make something good. And we can even understand if a group of people getting together make a vote, that also won't make that which is good. The clearest indication we might have of all of this is that simply being so-called natural doesn't mean it's good. Rather, that which is good or bad should be understood only in terms of the spiritual nature. And that which is so-called natural should only be understood in terms of the spiritual nature. Otherwise, you cannot determine what is good or bad or natural or unnatural. It may be natural in some cultures to have sex with one's mother. Does that mean it's good? And does that mean it's a principle? If you just go to another country, they'll kill you for the same thing. Who's deciding all of this business? The answer right now is the whimsy of the senses. The real answer is Vedic literature regulates what is that that should be done, what is that that should not be done. It therefore takes great intelligence to be a follower of the Vedic prescriptions. You cannot just proclaim something natural and nice and do, and then you should do like that. There must be some regulative principle. Regulative principle must be there. It's essential. Without regulative principle, there's no question of anything natural taking place. Just like one may say that sex life is natural. That may be true, but then why make abortions? Why use birth control? If your justification is that it's natural, then why birth control? Yes, it is natural. Yes, producing children is natural. Then why birth control? Therefore, we understand cheating process. And all of this justification, so-called justification, attempted justification, is bogus. Because if they wanted to maintain the principle of natural, then they would not make abortions, they would not make birth control, they would just have a lot of children. That, you can say, is natural. Of course, we won't call it cultured, <laughs> you know, 40 children running around, but we can call it natural, certainly. Actually, uh, these persons who are environmentalists and alternative culture and etc., they talk about nature and natural, but they have no idea what it means. Because they always bring in so many unnatural things which are against the nature and downright demoniac as well simply for sense gratification, because their definition is that to enjoy these senses is natural and anything else is unnatural. That may be all right from your point of view, but you cannot prove logically that this is a universal principle. No. You cannot prove this to be a universal principle. You can only prove it to be relevant in your own particular time, place, and circumstances in your own body. Because you've defined something in your way, all right, no one can stop you. But don't try and push that upon others as being the standard activity, the standard of nature. That you cannot do. But that they do anyway, but that they should not do. Therefore, we require some kind of authority where these things may be clarified. And that is what Veda is for, to clarify. After all, who's even asking such questions as we ask? Nobody questions this point about naturalness. 
And there are so many so-called alternative people who are thinking themselves so superior because of the way they deal with the material nature, yet they are, on the other hand, also a cause of destruction in the, in the society. They have nothing against abortions or other things. There's one so-called natural group in Germany where they just simply take children. They were taking care of runaway children and just having sex with them. And then the man there was trying was in the German parliament. They brought him up before some committee and he was screaming and yelling that they are just a bunch of animals in the parliament because they don't understand that children are meant for having sex. So what is natural? Yes, for an animal it's natural to do. But even animals don't do like that. So what, what is your nature, sir? It's even lower than animals. So you're superior to animals, that's why you eat them. Then why is it you act in a way which is even inferior to animals? So what is this nature? What is natural? It is a word which is totally misunderstood, <laughs> totally misused. Uh, in, in one word, it's completely bogus. Therefore, when we hear somebody tell us about how things are natural, we just turn off our ears. <laughs> what is natural? Natural is just nature. Nature is maya. Maya is illusion. Natural means real. Therefore, that which is natural is Vaikuntha. That which is unnatural is this material nature. Therefore, there's no question of speaking about that which is natural when you're in Maya. So the whole argument can be thrown out from the very beginning. And when you're in the Vaikuntha Loka, in the spiritual world, engaged in pure loving devotional service for the sake of the Supreme Lord Sri Krishna, then you can start talking about such things as natural. There it is naturally going on. Krishna playing with the coward boys, uh, enjoying pastimes with the gopis. That is natural because that is real. And there is only enjoyment. There is no suffering condition. There is no contradictory opinion. There is no other idea. Because there's only one idea in the spiritual world. We all serve Krishna. And that is the natural existence of the living entity. And here in the material world, there's also one idea. We all serve Maya. But then we have to throw out all such concepts as natural. Because when we become bound by the material nature, and the material nature is simply made of illusion. So this illusion of the material energy is binding us hand and foot. So we should give up the attachment to the material energy and accept attachment to the lotus feet of the Lord through pure devotional service. Material energy is beating us around left and right and right and left at every turn. Then why are we so attached? Because we are fools. Plain and simple. Of course, many devotees can easily say, yes, I'm a fool, but they don't believe it. Yes, I'm a fool, but as soon as somebody else calls me a fool, ah, then I'm very disturbed. Yes, I'm a fool, but don't you dare mention that. Because <laughs> if you tell me I'm a fool, you're going to get in trouble. <laughs> but everybody... Yeah, this is the material nature. If, if there's something and somebody mentions it, then we're very disturbed because no one's allowed to say anything against this body, which is our most beloved object. This body. This body, it's also natural. But what is its nature? To die. To grow old, diseased, and die. And to definitely do it. That is the nature. And we are attached very much to old age, disease, and death because we must get it. We are very insistent on maintaining the body nicely so it will grow old, get diseased, and die. That's like taking very good care of a car just before they put it in the cruncher, polishing it and washing it, and then they crunch it into a box. 
So we take very nice care of the body just so that it will grow old nicely and die nicely and get plenty of nice diseases. This is the madness of the material world. Of course, we're not saying don't take care of your body. But why be so attached to this thing after all? Well, because we live in it, that's why we're so attached to it. <laughs> but one shouldn't at least start proclaiming this as being nature, the naturalness, that I should be attached to this body. It is part of the illusory nature of the material world. So let us become attached to Krishna. That's natural, because that's eternal. That's the original <laughs> nature upon which everything's based. And when that nature is actually allowed to expand more and more in Krishna consciousness, then we'll be able to really perform natural service to the Supreme, which is uninterrupted, causeless, uh, and purified. All right, Hare Krishna.